Hello, and welcome to the live Nonprofit Pro webinar, your go-to guide for writing a winning nonprofit grant proposal, sponsored by GuideOne, an insurance company committed to social responsibility. My name is Mew T, Editor-in-Chief of Nonprofit Pro, and I'll be moderating today's event. There are a number of reasons why nonprofits apply for grants, but doing the research and finding which grants to apply for can be mind-numbing. On top of that, sitting down to write a grant proposal can be confusing and tedious. Grant writing doesn't have to be as intimidating as it sounds. In today's webinar, our speakers will share why your nonprofit should apply for a grant, what the process looks like, and what resources your nonprofit needs to prepare for the process, top tips and strategies to writing a winning grant. Emily Bratton is the Director of Grant Development at Hackensack University Medical Center Foundation, and she will be joined by Craig Shelley, Managing Director of OR Associates. I can't wait to hear what our speakers have to say. Before we get started, let's take a second to point out the tips for attendees widget on your console. It's the blue one with the wrench on it. If you missed the tech tips video we played leading up to the webinar, you can always click this widget for more information. Also, we will have a Q&A at the end of the webinar. You can answer your questions for that at any time using the Q&A box in the console. And without further ado, Emily and Craig, please go ahead. Wonderful. Um, first of all, a big thank you to Nonprofit Pro for hosting and to Guide One Insurance for sponsoring this webinar, where Craig and I will impart some of our hard-won wisdom about grants. You'll find that a lot of what we'll talk about deals more with your organization's preparation and vision than the actual proposal. Having a solid proposal is, of course, extremely important, but that's just the tip of the grants iceberg, and having a good program and strong vision is paramount. It's fairly easy to, easy to find information online about the specific parts of an application and what should be included in the various proposal sections. So I'm going to keep the very literal details on what to include in a proposal to a minimum and focus on more global concepts and tips, tricks, and guidance regarding writing and grant development, which I think will be more interesting and relevant given our limited time with you today. Um, and just to be clear, we are not covering government grants specifically today. So um, let's dig in. Um, first and foremost, the grant process should begin long before the funding opportunity or application is released. So you need to be grant ready. And let's talk about what that means. To this point, I will say, and I can't say this enough because I think just about everything else hinges on this, to thine own mission be true. Only you and your leadership know if this funding will truly advance your mission. Even if you can do something because there's an opportunity for grant funding, should you? How far are you willing to stretch your mission for funding? You may get the funding, but at what cost in creeping mission drift? If you take a throw it all against the wall and see what sticks approach, you're not thinking in a productive way, you're not going to get a lot of grants, and you're going to have a mess of a program with some areas underfunded and other gaps. Which leads into, do you have a strategic plan? What is your organization's vision? Is the request for a proposal that you're reviewing advancing a strategic initiative? Obviously, the answer should be yes. But you'll find that maybe it's advancing an old strategy or none at all because not everyone is aware of new or current priorities. So basically, making sure everyone on your team is on the same page will save you a lot of trouble down the line. Um, as you can tell, I might tend to approach things with a critical eye from the start. I need to convince myself in some ways before I can commit to a project that we should be doing this grant, that it's the right funder at the right time for the right project for the right organization, which is hopefully ours. Um, but that's because I felt the stress. When you're working on a proposal, you're spending your time, spending money, and it becomes crystal clear that if you did more soul searching as an organization at the outset, you would have said no to this opportunity. There's absolutely an opportunity cost to working on the wrong project. So push back on those colleagues who think you should try you know, for anything and everything. Because you know the ones. They go, oh, this Banks Foundation has a grant program. There's a branch a few towns over. Are we asking them for money? And I'd be like, uh, well, no, because their focus is on spurring economic development for women entrepreneurs. And we're a cancer organization. Oh, but we should just try, right? Uh, no. <laughs> All right, so that being said, you've decided that you have a solid foundation and you do want to apply for some grants. Do you have the basics ready to go? You know, your board list, budget, IRS information, audits, annual reports, 
often going back a few years. Now, some of these items should be slam dunks, and some may take some preparation or tracking down if they're updated annually or more frequently. So this is really critical. Don't let what should be background information or quote unquote minor details bog you down at the end. I've been there. Nothing is worse than having your whole grant application ready to go for tomorrow's deadline, except the person you need to get one key document from is on vacation, and you're left scrambling trying to find someone else to help you. Um, as Craig and I both used to work for the Boy Scouts, I will use the Scout motto, be prepared. Um, another way to be prepared is to look to the horizon. Wait a year. Prepare yourself for next year's opportunity if you're not ready for the upcoming deadline or if you just missed the deadline. If you're researching funding opportunities for a program and you find a good grant RFP that was due last week, put it on your calendar to check back on their website periodically if you don't know their funding cycle or whenever makes sense so you don't miss the next opportunity. You may be able to see the past RFP so you can plan your approach and responses now. Uh, keep a well-organized digital file of information and verbiage that you will likely need to refer to for future proposals. Don't waste your time reinventing the wheel, and it really helps for consistency. Um, grant readiness checklists are easily found online. Tools like these can be helpful because they are objective, and sometimes having an outside document showing your strengths and weaknesses can be more powerful than the inside grant writer talking ad nauseum about what needs to be done, how your financial controls need to be improved, etc. It's amazing how powerful documents written by outside experts can be. They just somehow hold more weight and credibility sometimes. Also, be real realistic about your infrastructure, ability to scale programs, staffing, resources, and sustainability. You probably shouldn't be going for the million dollar grant when your entire operating budget is $250,000. And lastly, you don't work in a vacuum. Get your team of allies and experts lined up and delegate, delegate, delegate. Different people on your team may have widely differing expectations of what the grant writer does. So you need to set your expectations and their expectations, as well as your boundaries and your needs up front. So that could mean making a calendar of who's doing what and really sticking to it. All right, I'll move on. Craig, you want to take this? Yeah, sure. And I just uh, reiterate or emphasize a few points that Emily made there. I mean, I think the uh, super, super important not to chase things that are unrealistic. Um, I can vividly remember numerous times I'm sure I encouraged Emily to chase things that were unrealistic. So um, she's very right there because that wasted a lot of both of our times. Uh, so yeah, I mean, be, be realistic what you're going after. And then also in terms of the being ready thing, one thing that I always found very helpful when I was doing this type of work um, exclusively was you know, at the beginning of the year, I had a pretty good sense of the five, six, ten things I was going to be writing grants for over the course of that year. Um, so I'd start up the templates right then. I'd spend, you know, two weeks in January just sort of locked away writing templates for, for things. And you would adjust them as the, as the year went on. You'd customize them for the right foundations. We added more initiatives, you know, things like that as the year went. But it helped me to just sort of dedicate some time right from the outset um, to get some really good templates built. And also, very specifically, to know that I was going to do that at the beginning of every year. Because to be honest with you, it prevented me from falling back on language I used a year ago, two years ago, three years ago. Like I would start with a blank page every year um, and build it out accordingly. So that's um, just sort of my uh, additions to Emily's points on being grant ready. Um, in terms of research, 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 yes, um, we should maybe add a fourth research. Um, I would uh, admit that uh, I am old enough to, uh, to, to recall um, when I had go to these big books uh, to do research on foundations. Um, the foundation directory online, many of you have probably heard of the Foundation Center. Um, that was a physical place, um, still is. Uh, I used to have to go there and look at the books. Uh, and then there was this huge innovation, and we had the CD-ROM shipped to us every year, and I was able to mm -hmm. look at these CDs and, and do the research right there. Um, but now, um, thankfully, you guys can, 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 we can all do this way easier and have a lot more information at our fingertips. So yeah, I'm old, but I am not like how to walk to school in the snow uphill old. I'm just old enough that I remember having to do this in books. But um, a couple of really good tricks here that I like. Um, you know, look at who's funding other nonprofits. I mean, the thing I always spend time with when I'm trying to find new funders for an organization is I look at what I would call comparable orgs. Um, some that are sort of mission, mission aligned and that are you know doing the same thing that I'm doing in the same size, but also some that are more aspirational, right? We all know that organization around the corner, down the block, across town, that has all the donors we want. 
Um, so I'll typically pick three, four, five organizations that sort of fit a criteria um, where I think their donors should be my donors. The foundations that fund them should be funding me. Um, I'll very specifically go through research and figure out, um, lay it out in a, in a pivot table in Excel and, and really just look through and say, which foundations are, are are funding multiples of those, right? So if you're if you're funding two, you're funding three, you're funding four, uh, and you're not funding me, that goes right to the top of my list. So I think that's a great way to do research. Um, foundations increasingly, you know, they're trying to flood a particular issue area. They're trying to to, to to push systems change, right? So they're not just going to fund, you know, if they care about healthcare. They're not going to just fund the hospital where everybody works. They're going to fund the entire health system in that community. So you know, if you can align and see who's funding. Um, your similar orgs, that, that's a great place to start and go after them. You know, look at the 990s, yeah, definitely. You know, that all that stuff's out there. You want to look at that. Um, to me, the next point, really creating relationship maps. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this later on. But at the end of the day, like, there's a lot more paperwork in raising foundation grants than there is in, say, high net worth individual major gifts. But it's still going to come down to relationships, right? It's, you know, who knows who and who can open that door to get someone's attention. Um, that's always going to be key. Uh, so I would always start also by looking at who's on my board, who do they know, and how do they connect to these foundations. Again, there's tools to do that. You can also do that by sitting with your board members and interviewing them. Um, lots of great ways to do it. And of course, you don't want to make the whole thing. I mean, if, if, if you know you're interested in, I don't know, let's pick on somebody big, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, you know, set up some Google alerts, you know, follow them on Twitter. Uh, you know, be active in following what they're doing and what they're thinking. Uh, and then you'll 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 know when the opportunity is right, you know, when it comes across your desk. And you'll also be better informed. We'll talk again a little bit about building relationships with foundation staff, but knowing what they're doing and what they're thinking about and what's what's important to them, um, that's all going to be key. So I can't stress research enough. You just have to kind of be a student of this, uh, of what's going on out there uh, at all times. Yeah, and I'll I'll just add to what Craig said. Um, you know, there's a big difference these days between you know, small family foundations where it might be a few people who have a few pet causes, and then the large, sophisticated foundations like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation who have teams of experts in different program areas, and they are very sophisticated. So, you know, if the small family foundation, um, you know, says they give to health, um, education, um, social services, and you go, oh, great, they, they give to education, um, that's me. When you do a deeper dive, you see it's one private school or one college year after year, and it's probably more of a pet cause where they went there, their kid went there. So you need to be able to kind of read between the lines. Education's not really their top priority. It's just a, a pet cause. So that's just one other thing I will say. All right. Okay. Um, focus on the process, not the outcome. This is really hard for me because, you know, if you're judged on the dollars you're bringing in, you're judged on an outcome that is sometimes out of your hands. But if you focus on the process and doing things the right way, you're much more likely to have a better outcome. So have some integrity as a professional and as an organization. It's kind of like if you build it, they will come. The application is just the very smallest part of this whole process, that tip of the iceberg that I mentioned earlier. You know when you're taking a short shortcut to achieve a short-term need, which in this case would be getting the grants out the door, versus doing the real behind-the-scenes work that needs to be done to make the, a program attractive and fundable. If you're only focusing on getting the grant out the door, you're not likely to get that grant. Sometimes the application sections, like logic models that make you groan, are actually really insightful tools that can help shape your program in a meaningful way if you embrace them. Um, so the app can be your map in a way. Um, but don't let yourself become the only team member becoming enlightened by this process. You know, a logic model or sustainability plan or SWOT analysis, you know, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats should not just be an exercise on paper to get the application completed. It should be informed by a team-based approach of stakeholders in your program or organization and something used for self-reflection and program guidance. Um, and as a grants person, like, you wear a lot of hats. You're the synthesizer, synthesizer, the big thinker, the wordsmith. And in many ways, you are at the heart, or the heart of the organization, and you really connect internal and external teams of partners. So you can suggest, cajole, inform, and inspire. 
but you should not be developing your organization's programs or deciding what direction they should take. You should, however, manage up and educate your leaders about what you need to be doing as an organization to make yourself grant worthy. Likewise, the grant writer can actually make a program sound better than it really is. And you may be like, yeah, that's what we need. <laughs> but don't be fooled, this is very dangerous when reality, aka program delivery and reporting, set in. The program experts cannot expect you to whip up a fairy tale. I'll never forget when I needed some information for proposal, and one of the program leaders, a very nice guy, by the way, and Craig, I'll tell you who it is later, um, said to me point blank, next time you want to ask me for something, don't. This was such a demoralizing moment as a young grant writer because it said to me that even our program leaders didn't get it. I was a nuisance asking for critical details. I should quote unquote figure it out on my own, or quite possibly the insinuation was that I should just make the information up. This is a very bad thing. Proposals should put you in the best light, but also be reality based. Furthermore, funders can tell when you're chasing the money. In some cases, they've had your job before. They know all the t tricks and they can see right through you. They may come back to you with very specific pointed questions to break through the BS or vagueness you're sending their way, but sometimes they actually just genuinely want more details, which is a good thing as they're actually reading your proposal carefully enough to ask questions. Um, but you know what, losing a grant can actually be a really great tool for improving your approach in the future too. Talk to your team, why did we lose? What can we do differently? What, what didn't come through on paper? Um, and lastly, grants can help make or break your credibility. Take the time to be honest with yourself and funders while playing with your strengths, tying your organization's programs to greater societal and funder needs, and adjusting the angles for different funder priorities. Your program can wear different hats with integrity. But if you don't follow through on your grant, don't carry out the activities you said you're going to, don't spend the money the right way or in a timely manner, don't provide the measurement data that you promised, you're, you're just gonna give yourself a really bad reputation. Um, and I've heard it said that bad data is better than no data. You can think about whether you agree with that or not, but think about this too. If a funder awards grants for two different organizations and one's program is mediocre, but they actually measured what they were doing and kept data on it, that's probably more powerful than the other program, which in many ways was awesome and possibly a better program, but they weren't keeping good track of their activities or outcomes. Data is tangible, data tells a story. It's something a program officer can bring to their board. Even if your numbers aren't exactly where you wanted them to be at the end of your grant, it still opens the door for a conversation internally and with the funder. It can show what you need help with on your next round of funding or for the next round of program delivery. It's authentic. And I would say too, in terms of the, you know, focusing on the, well, one, I, I would say, Emily, I think I've narrowed down to two people who told you to, to buzz off when you asked them for information, so I can't wait to find out if I was right later. Um, but, uh, you know, like the whole idea, of, right, like it's out of your hands. Um, it is, and I, and I hate to say that, right, like I, I'm, like most fundraisers have this belief, like you can bend reality to, you know, what you want it to be. Um, and I'm have at times completely unrealistic in my career, probably including with Emily, saying, you know, of course you should be able to get this and, you know, figure out how to do it, and, you know, you can control if they say yes or no. You can't. Um, but you can, as Emily describes, control the process, right? You can do all the right things, and then still, you know, 50, 60% of the time, you know, you're going to hear no. Um, you know, we're fundraisers. That's what happens. We hear no a lot more than we hear yes. But, you know, the more you control the process, the, the, the better the outcomes will ultimately be. And the only other thing I'll say about data is, too, like, some, some things, some places your hands are just, are just high, right? And they're, they're very um, prescriptive about how, about what they want you to measure. Um, and that's, you know, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But, you know, often we have the opportunity to define success, right? Like, so if you tell them that success is, you know, 20 widgets became, I don't know, fidgets, you know, then that's what they expect you to do. Um, so I, I think you have the opportunity up front to decide how you're going to measure success and be very clear about that. Um, so you do, you know, that that is more in your control, I think, than, than often sometimes people think. A lot of people get, get really sort of hung up in that. Um, but I think you can you can control it. Yeah, and um, when Craig and I worked together, it was a long time ago. It was over 10 years ago when a lot more of our proposals were actually hard copies going out in the mail. But even though we can't control the outcome, I still do something when I am mailing a paper proposal that Craig taught me. I, I give it a kiss for good luck before it goes in the mailbox. <laughs> 
I think that's key. That that that, <laughs> that yeah, makes all the difference. Yep. And plus, you get paper, right. and you get paper cuts on your lip. But other than that, it's a good. It's a good. <laughs> all right, matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a grant. Okay, repeat after me. A grant is not a gift. A grant is not free money. A grant means more work. If you want money with fewer strings attached, potentially, look to your loyal individual donors or smaller family foundations where the grants are more like traditional donations than grants tied to activities and outcomes. True grants are for a particular purpose and have more intensive reporting requirements. So ask yourself, do we, you know, if we receive this award, will we be excited or panicked? Do we really want this grant? Are we willing to do the work and do it well? What is the opportunity cost in terms of time, money, staffing, etc.? Some grants just are not worth the money. Be careful what you wish for. Um, a grant should not be intended as a lifeline for a struggling program. I know that can be tempting, but a grant should really build on your strengths and increase your capacity to make whatever impact you're making even greater. Um, don't put lipstick on a pig. To mix the farm animal metaphors, funders want to bet on a winning horse, or at least a viable horse or an up-and-comer. Um, but they don't, want, they don't want to be plug in the hole from the Titanic, you know. Um, don't expect a grant in perpetuity. You need to be very, very specific about what you're requesting. What new activities can you carry out with the funds you're requesting? What new constituents will you serve? Not just, we need funds for XYZ program to keep it afloat. Why do you need the funds if it's not to do something new? Be clear. Um, I like to think of finding the right funder as like making a job match or a dating match. You're both trying to find the right mutually beneficial partner to add value. You may work in charity, but don't think of the grantor as doing charity by awarding you a grant. They're looking for a partner who can help them fulfill their goals. This is really important. You are not a beggar. You're a partner in carrying out activities to provide some sort of transformation in society that they are looking to make. They want ROI, and you better provide the data to prove it. I'm not trying to downplay the importance of your organization's goals or to be cynical when I say that the funders want their goals fulfilled, but this is where that harmonious matching comes into play. Some of your goals and vision must intersect naturally with some of the funders' goals and vision. That's where the magic happens. The computers you want for an underserved classroom are not just equipment that you need a grant of $20,000 for because you don't have the money for them in your budget. News. They are tools that will help level the playing field in education and foster creativity and promote STEM and pr pave the way for career readiness. That's what you're selling if you can back it up, not computers. All right, think transformationally and collaboratively. Ask yourself, how is our work addressing needs and goals beyond our own? Who can we partner with to increase the good we're doing in an organic way? What sets us apart from our partners and or other organizations doing similar work? Don't try to be everything to everybody, but be authoritative about what you're good at. If your proposal is about transforming your one square block, you own that block. Also, realize that many corporations that have foundations or giving programs are really savvy these days about philanthropy and have tied their philanthropic goals to their business goals to make a philanthropic impact in a natural, organic way or to improve their image. So, you know, PepsiCo, for example, funds nutrition programs about healthy eating. Um, Tory Burch Foundation supports women entrepreneurs. ExxonMobil funds math, science, and enge engineering education. Um, so just because a huge corporate foundation has tens of millions of dollars to spread around, it doesn't mean they're throwing it around. They're getting more targeted and strategic every day with where they're putting those dollars and those organizations that can make the connection for how their work fits in with a corporate philanthropic value and can make a difference in a meaningful way have the best shot. And I think, you know, this, this concept of savviness amongst um, philanthropists that's particularly um, relevant in foundations, but I mean, I think you're saying it everywhere, right? I mean, people, when I started, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, you gave $10,000 to everybody, right? The Red Cross got it, the Boy Scouts got it, the, the Girl Scouts got it. It was just sort of the thing you did. You spread your money around, whether you're a foundation or you were an individual or you were a company. That's not how this game is being played increasingly, right? Like, it's, let me find the one thing that's really important and I'll go invest it in heavy and hard. 
and uh, I just think we need to recognize that. And with that comes a different set of questions because the dollar figures are getting higher. You know, when I used to give a little bit to everybody, you know, when I want to narrow it down and give a lot to a few, um, I'm going to ask a lot more questions. And I just, I, I think we need to be prepared for that. A um, couple of the things I would just sort of riff off of that I'm really said, you know, this, this concept of, you know, we just need the money, right? I mean, no successful proposal ever has been, you know, I need money and you have it. Right, but 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 you hear it all the time. It's you know well, why why would we want to raise this money? It's almost it's almost always because we need it because we can't afford to do this. Um, and why would we go to this person? Well, because they have a lot of money, right? I mean, it used to be you know everybody thought Oprah should be on their prospect list. You know now it's everybody thinks Mark Zuckerberg should be on their prospect list. You know if, if your greatest connection to Mark Zuckerberg is that you are on Facebook, that's probably not going to be enough. Um, similarly, just because you you know maybe read Oprah's magazine doesn't mean she's going to be a donor to you. Um, so I, I just think you know being smart about who you're trying to make a match with in the first place um, is key. But then, almost more importantly, is that story that you're selling. As Emily said, that transformation. You know, nobody wants to be. I hate to say it. Nobody wants to be on a losing team, right? You know, the, 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 they want to understand what you can accomplish together. What, as a team, you are going to win. What, it, what change you're going to make in the world. Um, and it's really much more of an investment than a gift. Also, as Emily, as Emily definitely said. Um, and then the last thing, and I just because I sort of also came up in the questions um, and some of the, the, the notes here, and don't worry, we'll, 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 we'll have time to get to most of them at the end, I think. But since this one came up, I think it's relevant here. You know, it's not forever. You know, yes, there are some foundations that are set up, you know, where they're going to give money to these six charities forever. So that's great. Um, and, you know, congratulations. But that, that, that's few and far between. So, you know, this idea of, you know, how do I get them to continue to give me money in the third year? Uh, which was the specific question in the questions, but I think you know, also fits in here. And they may not. You know, we have to constantly be thinking about, you know, how together are we accomplishing accomplishing goals? And it should be set up that at some point we will accomplish this set of goals, um, and you can move on, or perhaps there's another set of goals we'd like to accomplish together. Um, but I think, you know, trying to think of a foundation as an ATM machine that year after year is going to be there when you come back to them, you can't. You know, if you do all of these things right. You know, all these things we're talking about, and particularly the thing we're going to get to next, you know, there's a chance that they'll stay with you for over the long term. But I do think, you know, you have to so you can't take that for granted. And you have to be creative about, again, what are the mutual goals that you're going to accomplish? And you have to give them faith that you're going to accomplish goals and move forward. Um, so segueing from matchmaking uh, to relationships, um, you know, relationships really, really matter. Um, duh. Right. So, but this is this this is true of all parts of fundraising. Um, I think there was a time when, if you could write well, people assumed you weren't a good major gift officer, so you should go, you know, do foundation fundraising. Well, it's the same skill sets plus you have to write really well. So, if anything, I'd say foundation fundraising is more complicated. You know, you have to build relationships. You have to, you know, have connections with these folks. You know, they are people. I mean, as the first point here on this slide says, you know, funders are human. I've met them. I swear it's true. They're actual living, breathing people, um, and you know they they have the same needs and wants and desires that we all have. You know, do you need to be their best friend? No, no. And don't don't think for a second that you are because you're not and with any of your donors, right? But you need to have a responsive, real, you know, authentic relationship. Uh, and I don't think you can underestimate, particularly in a foundation that has any sort of staff, whether that's two people or two hundred people. Help them look good. Um, everybody wants to look good for their boss and. I have news for you. Everybody has a bus. So you know, uh, getting things on time, giving them information they could share up, the, up, up with their colleagues. You know, do things that are going to make make them look good. You know, stay, and in doing so, stay in touch. I mean, I don't like to go, you know, probably more than six weeks without having some contact with the funder. And it doesn't have to be a 25-page report. But you know, send them a picture of a couple of kids, you know, on the new playground that they helped to build, um, just because you happen to be down there. You know, to me, I, I always look for excuses. You know, within my day-to-day -day life, that or day-to-day -day life or day-to-day -day professional life, where it allowed me to sort of connect back to funders. And yeah, you know, I'll be honest. I may have sent almost the exact same QT message to ten funders, but hey, that's that's that they don't know that, and that's fine. You know, it's it's authentic. I saw this, and it made me think of you. You know, you need to do that, and you need to be deliberate about it. Um, you know, now this day and age, there's all sorts of you know tools you can use to 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 remind you to do tasks. But you know, set something up so you know every couple of months. You know, or you remind yourself to sort of get in touch with this funder. You know, build that relationship. Um, that's how you get lucky. Right? I mean, it's it's a cliche, but cliches are always true. The harder you work, the luckier you get. You know, so just stay in contact, stay in touch. 
Uh, we talked about research and this idea of board members. There's been a lot of questions I see on the question board coming up around, you know, how do you do relationship mapping? Well, you know, the easiest thing, and I'll tell you, and uh, a plug that I'm not getting paid for, um, you know, relationship science. It's, it's, it's. I would tell you when I looked at it five years ago, proving that this is not a plug. I don't think it was that great of a product. Um, but as they've gotten more information, it's become better. You know, it is a really good way to sort of map your board members. I recognize it's expensive. Not everybody can do that, so that's fine. Um, all it's really doing is scanning the internet of different boards that your people are on and where they went to school and comparing those lists. So if it was me and I didn't have access to a tool like that, the first thing I would do, again, I'd set up a pivot table and I would say, okay, these are the four boards that you know this guy sits on. Let me cross check you know, who else is on those boards. And you, know, you start to build a map that way. I saw somebody mention in the questions, you know, well, that's time consuming. It is, um, and it's laborious, but you know it can be done, and it needs to be done. You know, it's as, it's as important as uh, a lot of the other things that we do. So I would recommend you do it, refresh it. You know, every couple of years for everybody. Every time somebody new comes on the board, do it. Um, again, it's one of those things that's 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 worth that's worth your time. Um, in terms of you know this last point here, giving background. Don't assume they know your programs. You know, even if you've already sent in your proposal, don't assume they've read it. I mean, I hate to say that. I mean, I'm sure they read them all eventually, or at least skim them. I don't know. You know, it varies from person to person. But be able to, when you engage in a conversation, don't assume that they know everything. Don't assume that they've read, 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 read what you've sent. You know, be prepared to give that background. Um, and I also think, you know, more than anything, I would recommend if there is a way for you to get in person with the staff of this foundation or the donors of this foundation or the board of this foundation before you've sent in your proposal, before they make their decision, after they funded you, you know, there's no replacement for in-person contact. And yeah, you know, depending on the, the scope and size of your organization and where your funders are, maybe you have to get on an airplane or take an Amtrak or drive really far. Um, but that's time well spent. And it's an investment I think you have to make. Um, once you have a face-to-face -face connection, you know, there's still nothing that, that, that beats that. Um, so, yeah, so relationships matter. They matter a lot. Yeah, I absolutely. And I try not to think of the funder as the great odds behind the screen who, you know, is untouchable, you know. Um, I think any, any connection you can make, um, you know, you know, you do your research and there's an organization they fund and you have some connection with them. Even if you pick up the phone and you're trying to, you know, create an entree in the conversation, if you can mention some kind of common connection, it makes you seem like you're already part of their community or circle and they might just feel a little bit more warmly about you or just, oh yeah, not some complete cold call. Um, all right, we're going to move on to follow directions. Okay, following directions. Sorry, is, that, 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 that was me. I was, I was trying to be helpful and flip your slide, but oh, you also flipped. It's all right. <laughs> following directions sounds like something that should be very easy to do, but you'd be surprised at how many people do not follow directions. Um, it's really critical. Funders are looking for reasons to call down their stack of applications and don't give them a reason by being sloppy. Takes are given guidelines seriously. Don't waste your time or theirs. Um, if you really think that you should be on their radar but don't quite fit their guidelines, you might want to send an email, make a call, or send a one-page letter. But really, don't waste your time writing a whole proposal if you're not in the right ballpark. Um, and again, answer your questions, not the questions you wish, wish they asked. Read and reread what you wrote to make sure you didn't drift off topic un unintentionally. Um, I see this a lot when non-grant professionals are drafting responses, um, and you know, and I want program people to be helping me out and drafting responses for things they know about, but it's, I'm always amazed by how they don't read. They know their program, they don't directly answer the questions asked. So it's your job to keep them on track. They'll hate you now because like you're such a stickler for it, but they'll thank you later because um, if, if you don't nudge them into compliance, you're not getting funded. Um, every foundation is different. What you wrote for one funder likely cannot be cut and paste wholesale without tweaks in your approach or response for another funder. Often it's just a shift in emphasis that's needed. As I mentioned before, one program can wear many hats. To one funder, a particular youth development program may be attractive because you show it's helping prevent incarceration, which is their specific interest. To another funder, it may be attractive because it's preventing teen pregnancy. To another funder, it could be helping increase high school graduation rates. 
Um, so pr promoting your program in different ways is not disingenuous if the program and its data bear it out. This is where you have to kind of become a master of spin, a salesman, a marketer, but it's in a genuine way because you're just highlighting your assets and tailoring them for each particular audience. Greg, should I move on to my next slide, or do you have anything to add to that? No, I, um, I'm, I'm, I've never been big on directions, but they're really important. But you've, <laughs> you've covered that. You've covered that fantastically. Excellent. Okay. Um, write like a journalist. Don't bury the lead. And if you if you are a journalist, you know that lead is spelled wrong here. It's actually L-E-D-E -E in the journalism world, but that's okay. Um, think of the inverted pyramid used in journalistic writing. The most important, crucial, the most crucial information comes first, then important details, then less important but nice to know information. Basically, don't make them wait for the good stuff. They may get bored reading through your entire organization's history before they get to your core message or request. You can reiterate or reinforce key information throughout, but make sure to front load it so it's clear from the outset why you are writing this request. What are you asking them for? Be specific and clear. Um, you may be tempted to tug at heartstrings through flowery descriptions and imagery. Don't. Your facts and data will create the poll in a much more effective way. Too many adjectives start to wear thin. Um, I'm not trying to say you can't tell a story or paint a picture that could actually be quite effective, but you do need to be careful about steering clear of theatrics. Um, lastly, lastly on this one, you know, attend seminars on grant writing, you know, read examples of other successful grant proposals that can be very educational to see how other people are doing things. Um, and if you are hiring a grant writer, maybe your small organization don't have one, be sure to ask for writing samples of their past proposals and ask yourself who you would be more likely to fund. And I mean, to know Emily is to not be at all surprised that she corrected a, a typo in her own slides um, or, or, or an error. But anyway, that's, um, I, I, and it's funny, I didn't think about this until um, Emily came up with this slide and I think it's 100% valid. But I never really thought about it. I would bet you if I thought back through the most successful grant writers I've worked with, which Emily is definitely one, um, they have a journalism background or they studied journalism. And I was a journalism major. Uh, yeah, I just did, I think there is something to this whole concept of, you know, think about it that way um, and, you know, get to the facts, open up with them, you know, make sure everybody knows what's going on, support it with data. Um, that, that style of writing, I think, is, is very transferable to, uh, to grant writing. Um, and I'm embarrassed I hadn't made that connection before, but it, but but it's certainly a good one. The next uh, the next slide. Um, don't wait till the last minute, right? I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. I'm a like born procrastinator. Um, don't tell my clients that. Um, but like I, I really I, I will put things off as as much as 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 much as I can. So like what I used to do is I would trick myself. Um, I mean, it's, there's a point here about setting outlook calendar items. I'm a big fan of that. Like whatever it says on my calendar, it's just do I do. Um, but I don't trick myself. Like I, I would, without the deadlines for things, I'd stick it in. It'd be funny. I'd be there putting the final, final touches on something. And be like, all right, I'm going to get this out right on the deadline. And I would do like one last double check against the deadlines, you know, on their website or whatever, to make sure I hadn't missed anything. And I would notice that like the deadline was like two weeks from now. And I realized, well, because you know, past Craig did future Craig a favor by pretending on his calendar like it was due earlier, right? So I, I, I feel free to play those types of games and, and trick yourself. But you know. You have to come back to your writing again and again and again, which you know, I said earlier, one of the things I like to do is write a lot of templates and sort of stock language I know I'm going to need for the year at the beginning of the year, because every time you look at it, you will make it better. So whether that's a one-off proposal that you wrote specific for this, you know, put it aside and come back to it in a few days, you'll make it better. Or again, if you have the opportunity to use some language again and again, every time you use it, you'll improve it. Um, you know, you just you see things, you know, when you're, you're today's, what well, looks like a masterpiece today, you know, looks like your kid's uh, finger painting tomorrow, right? So, like, it, it, you you will make it better as you go. So, give yourself the time to do that because funders deserve to see your best best work. But more importantly, the programs you're advocating for, the organizations you're raising fund for, they deserve your best work, right? So that that, that they're worthy of it. So, give yourself a chance to do that. Um, how do other people look at it? You know, I mean, I, I would say, you know, my. my <laughs> I always say, like, you know, get your spouse who doesn't know anything about what you do to, to read through it. 
Um, I have tried that unsuccessfully with my wife several times, but um, it is good to get someone that doesn't really do this every day to read through. We just did, it wasn't a proposal, but it was a, a case statement for an organization that you know, we thought was dynamite, the team that I was working on, the client thought it was dynamite. They said, just you know, do me a favor, let's have someone in the office that knows nothing about this look at it, and they shred it. You know, they just came back and they said, it just doesn't make any sense, and, and they were right. You know, so I, I think it's important to have someone that's not in the weeds with you read something and be like, I don't get it, I don't understand it, it doesn't make sense. So you know, have that, that have that there. And when you get those that type of feedback, you know, it, 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 get rid of your ego. I mean, I, I I like to write. I would tell you that I think I'm a really good writer. I know that everything that I ever wrote that I gave to Emily, she improved, and I could say that about a dozen people, right? Like so. It, it, it don't you know? It's not about you. It's not about you know. You're not the next Hemingway, right? Like, it, it, and even if you were, like, he had an editor, probably, right? I don't know that, but he must have. Like, your work can get better, and others will improve it. So don't don't get hung up when you know I wrote this, and this is the magic words. You know, those magic words maybe will work some other time, but you know, get the best words for this proposal right now. Um, you know, get the other people that are around you ready for the deadlines, right? If you need information from the program staff um, and you recognize that, as Emily's experience earlier when she shared that they told her to, you know, don't ever ask me for information again, you know, make sure you're giving them plenty of time. They have jobs. They're not sitting around being like, I hope the grant writer comes in today and asks me 25 questions, right? Like, in theory, they're out there every day doing something, right? Like, so they're busy. So make sure that they understand what you need far before or long before you need it. And again, use them with reminders, out the calendar items, you know, whatever's going to work best for them. Yeah. And yeah, I, I do think the most important part is getting other people to read it. Um, and since I'm more of a generalist, I can't say I'm really an expert in any particular area. Um, I'm often that person who's asking the dumb questions when I get the program people. You know, I work at a medical center now helping every specialty here. I, I can't be an expert in all of them. So they come back with some um, proposal, and I'm just asking the most basic, you know, potentially they think stupid questions, because again, if I don't understand it, the funder's not going to understand it. So I think that's critical. Um, and we have a little bit of time left just to touch on the proposal sections. Um, and again, this is the kind of information where um, you can find a lot of examples online, so I didn't want to go too deep in the weeds with this. But, um, you know, the executive summary or abstract, um, I find it often, often makes sense to write this part last because, you know, if you're changing your ideas or, you know, your project details during the writing process, um, you're going to have to keep, you know, fixing this. So might as well just do it once at the end. Um, need statement. Obviously, there should be data-driven. You can use the data from the government or you know, the census, other legitimate sources. You can use your own data from polling or surveying your own members or constituents. Um, and again, don't be myopic. Document the need in greater society, not just your organizational need. Um, you, know, you may not be single-handedly solving the hunger problem in your community, but you may, have, you may be part of the solution. So own that piece and how it fits into the greater community need. Um, goals and objectives, um, you know, sometimes people get confused by this. Um, you know, objectives are the concrete activities to be carried out to help meet greater goals. So the goal may be, um, you know, your reason for being is to help reduce homelessness in New York City. But the objective may be to get 100 people off the streets for a full month. Um, the objectives may be very different based on the population you're working with, but it is something concrete versus, versus the ideal vision that you're working towards. Uh, measurement, evaluation, you know, are you tracking your data? You can't know or tell what you're good at unless you're measuring it. Measurements, again, tell your story in a meaningful way. Learn the difference between outputs and outcomes. Um, a lot of people give outputs instead of outcomes, and that's a big no-no. Um, you know, the outputs are the tangible actions you will do through a grant. Outcomes are the actual changes in behavior, environment, or the like that result from the actions you take. So for example, it doesn't matter if you held 12 classes on parenting skills to 300 individuals if no one put the skills into, act, into action. So the output would be the classes you held, and the outcome would be what they're actually doing with what they learned in your class. Um, you know, you can do simple pre-post surveys of knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors. 
that, that may be enough in many cases to show that your program is making a difference in people's lives. You don't always need you know, a fancy professional evaluator to document um, indicators of transformation. Um, budget, you know, budgets are, you know, their own beast, and that could be a whole another topic, but, you know, don't neglect to do document all costs, all your overhead administrative costs, fringe benefits, in-kind costs, even if they're not part of the funding request. You know, you want to show how much skin your organization or your partners have in the game beyond the grant. You know, the funder doesn't want to think they're the sole source, um, you know, of income for this program, and, and you need to show the big picture. Um, and also, just touch on quickly, you know, sustainability, impact. Don't expect the grant to fund you in, perpe in perpetuity. It should be a launch pad. Um, and you should be thinking about sustainability and how to develop self-sufficiency self from the very beginning, whether it's by absorbing costs once the program is up and running into your organizational budget or finding a way to do something creative. So for example, um, this is actually for a government grant, but in a recent federal falls prevention grant we submitted, we're saying that once our staff are trained into evidence-based fall prevention programs, you know, if this all works out, we plan on starting a consulting business kind of to other area agencies to show them how to launch fall prevention programs. Um, so they would actually pay us for that service. So that's a way that we're thinking beyond the potential three-year grant. Um, no funder wants to think that after the money runs out, your program just dies. You know, what's the, what's the point of them giving you money then? So you need to be looking well into the future from the very beginning. Um, and if you do want to go back to the same funder, don't go for the same exact thing year after year. You know, you have to change it, expand it. You know, show your success that you've had and how you'll build on it again. And that, you know, it's all part of a conversation, you know. And I saw a question earlier. It's like if you have a three-year grant and you're, you know, two years in, two and a half years in, and you can sit down and look at your successes and your challenges, and then that's a conversation for, you know, hopefully getting the next three years of funding. So with that, that's all I have. Craig, do you want to add in anything else? No, I, I think, you know, for me, uh, like with these sections, like I always, like when I was done writing some daily like proposal, I always went back to like a document like this that sort of described each of the sections I should have and just sort of mentally looked at this, looked at each section and said, all right, is this what I want it to be? Do I have all the pieces here? So, you know, it's important to do, to, 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 to sort of check yourself on this really every time you write a proposal. Um, well, you've been a fabulous audience. No, uh, New, how do you want to handle um, questions? I mean, I can, we can see them. We can try and answer that way. You want to pick them? How do you want to, how do, you want to do that? Um, you probably uh, explained this in advance and I didn't listen. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I have a list here, and I'm just going to get started, if that's okay with you two. You guys ready? Sure. Go. Yeah. Excellent. All right, so um, the first question is, please address how well-established endowed nonprofits can still make their points with smaller grant requests that funding is critical to fill programs. That's a challenge, right? I mean, typically, hello? Go ahead, yeah. I would say that that's, that's a challenge. I mean, I, I've typically seen, like, you know, that's a sign of financial strength. It's a sign we manage money well. It's a sign we're a winning team, you know, like, and that's great. But I, like, two weeks ago, so I heard somebody get turned down, and the exact answer was, I look at financial. They're really strong. You have a huge endowment. I could just see that there are other people that need my money more. Um, so I, I think part of it is facing into it and sort of defining why you have that. Um, you know, why are you well endowed? Why do you have a lot of money? And, you know, again, it's trusting it's because we've managed our money well, because what we do is important, because we're going to be here forever. You know, that there's some, some, some real critical ways to address that or obvious ways to address that. Um, so I think you have to don't hide from it because they're going to figure it out. But then it's, it's about articulating why you have this particular need and why they are the one person that can fund it, right? So it, you sort of have to differentiate of like, yes, we're set up well in perpetuity, um, but right now we have this need and, you know, we have money put away so we're here for tomorrow, but right now today we also have to do more than what we've been doing currently and that requires additional capital. That's a tough, it's a tough needle to thread, but somewhere right. I mean, in what there is the answer. Yeah, I mean, even a well-endowed nonprofit, you know, there's kind of guidelines whether you're 
paying out 5% from that endowment every year. I mean, you're not, you can't tap into all those funds all the time, but it does show your credibility that you, that you are, um, you know, well established. And so you're probably in a really good place in many cases to make a big impact with the right funder for the right project. But yeah, I, I totally get the, the question, the conundrum. And is that right? And if somebody, if a fund is really hung up on that, that's not going to be for you, right? Like I just, it's, there are some people that won't get past that and you know move on to the to the next one, unfortunately. But there, there are a lot of people that will understand and sort of see the nuance there and, and be okay with it. Excellent. Um, okay, so the next one is if a nonprofit does not have the funds available to hire an agency, write grant proposals. Um, what free resources are available to learn successful grant proposals? I mean, you know, I've taken classes. They're not all free, but they're not huge costs at organizations like the Foundation Center. Um, you know, you, you can join organizations like, you know, the Grants Professional Association, um, which is national, and you join their lo local chapter talk to other people in your area. You can kind of learn from peers. Um, and even if, you know, you don't have a full-time grant person on your staff, you know, you can kind of cobble it together by, you know, joining these groups and they get daily or weekly email digests of questions from other members. And it's very collaborative. So that's something I would suggest. You can participate in webinars like this. No, um, yeah, uh, you don't need to have it. You don't need to have a dedicated grant writer, and that's not right for every organization. Um, as Emily said, you know, we'll tell you that this is, you know, a highly tuned skill set, and you know, you have to be a real expert. The reality is, you know, it's not brain surgery. You can figure it out. You know, there's enough resources out there that, you know, some program people can work on it on the side if you need, but set your expectations realistically, right? Like they're not going to suddenly bring in $10 million in new grants, you know, if it's, you know, they're doing it off the corner of their desk when they have an extra 20 minutes on Saturday morning, right? So you are going to sacrifice by not being able to invest in it. That's everything, right? There's no free money out there. But you, you might be okay with that trade-off. You know, you're going to miss some opportunities. But, you know, as long as if you're okay with capturing just a handful, um, there are ways to become a quote-unquote, you know, grant writer without being a quote-unquote grant writer. Right, great. Right. That's, um, um, so many nonprofits, particularly in high-need areas, are dependent on philanthropy, but not all programs can be sustainable with other sources of revenue. The question is, how do you navigate the sustainability question with funders in reality the program plan donation? Yeah, that always used to drive me crazy, right? How are you going to be financially sustainable? I'm like, well, because somehow next year I'm going to convince you to give me this money again. Um, and, and it's a tough, I'm biased, right? This is the shoemaker selling you shoes. You know, I think it's okay for some things to depend on philanthropy forever. Unfortunately, I'm minority viewpoint. Um, so yeah, people are more interested than ever before, like what is your financial model or how are you going to you know, develop an earned revenue stream? And, and you're right, some things it's always going to be dependent on philanthropy, but maybe it's not always going to be dependent on that person's philanthropy, right? Like there's a way to position of like, you can help us grow this program to a point where it has, you know, consensus support amongst many funders, um, or it has consensus support within our organization that is absorbed within our larger budget. So, you know, again, it's still dependent on philanthropy, but it's not dependent on specifically people that you're marking funds for it. It's now part of our budget. So as we raise, you know, general support, you know, this is included. It's, it's seen as that kind of priority. So I think that's probably the right answer to that question, but I agree. It's, it's a really frustrating one because, um, you know, some things are always going to depend on philanthropy. And I'll tell you the flip side, I've seen organizations do really well in building models of, you know, this is how we're going to earn revenue and how we'll be able to decrease our philanthropy over time. And then you want to know what I also saw happen because it, it never brought philanthropy to zero, right? It was we, we can decrease the philanthropy by having these other revenue streams. <clears throat> the philanthropists, what they heard was, you don't need me anymore. You don't like me anymore. You know, where's sort of the dirty money that you don't want to take anymore? So after pushing for years to come up with a model that would make us not dependent on your money, on you know, I um, forget who's us and you're in this, but you know, of we don't want to have, we don't want you to be dependent on us forever. They finally come up with a model that answered that question, 
and it really turned off the therapist because it made them feel like you don't need me anymore. So it's a tough situation. I mean, I think philanthropy is a beautiful thing, and it should continue forever. But um, probably the figuring out how this thing gets to the point that it's absorbed within your budget is the answer to that question. Yeah, and I would say, like, <clears throat> when you start, you know, singing, you know, your stories, praises from the rooftop, rooftops and getting other stakeholders to tell your story for you, you know, you're not, if your program's in a high-need area, you're probably not doing it on your own. You probably have other partner organizations that are supporting this. And um, when it comes more, like, embedded in the community, um, it would be really hard to get rid of a program like that if it, if it really is fulfilling a need. So make sure that you and your partners are telling each other stories and how you're working together as well. Excellent. Um, so can you guys talk a little bit more about creating a relationship map? How can busy fundraisers executive this in the most efficient and effective way? Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, so relationship science is the is probably the best tool for this that I've seen. So if you can go buy that, I would buy that. Um, but you know, it has limitations too, like everything does. I mean, the best bet is to manually sit there, look at your board members, see the boards that they're on, and then you know, create a list of everyone that's on those boards, um, and uh, you know, sort of building it out that way. So. I was using as an example, which would be terrible because I would have no money. But like, right? So you'd be all right. So Craig Shelley. So what boards does Craig Shelley sit on? So Craig sits on the AFP New York City board. You know, it's all right. So now let's listen to everybody who's on that board and see is there anybody that we want to know because we know Craig can introduce us. Craig's on the advisory board for nonprofit pro. Let's see. You know, is there anybody there that 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 we know that he wants that we that he knows that we want to connect to? So it can be laborious, but it's time well spent. Um, or you know, relationship science more or less does it for you. You know, automates doing that, um, but I think it's particularly more effective in people in larger cities, to be honest with you, because they've, they've just essentially built a database on people. So if it's someone that's never, they, no one's ever come looking for it before, they probably have less data, but that's, that's how that works. Excellent, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, so they, their question is, they are a 48-year-old, well-respected, endowed nonprofit, yet they always need grant funding to fill funding gaps in program areas. How do they leverage um, their received well here endowed status with actual needs of ball rolling? I think we kind of touched on some of this before. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd say that's the same, right? I mean, we sort of the well endowed organization. I think it's the same, the yeah. same, the same answer. Yeah. Okay. So how about um, how, how do you guys feel about including stories or visuals? Big fan. I think you know Emily's right. You got to be careful with the stories, but if you can visualize data. Like you know, and I, you know, visual to me, visual um, visuals isn't you know maybe there's one or two pictures of cute kids, but to me, like graphs, charts, that kind of stuff, that that's huge. And if I've learned you know anything, our owner of our firm is a former Goldman Sachs guy, and he drove it through, has beaten into my head. I think in paragraphs and in prose, as he points out, he goes, people with money think in terms of numbers and graphs. Um, so yeah, I, I'm 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 a big fan of that kind of stuff. I don't know what you found, Emily, but I, I'm I'm a fan. Yeah, I mean, exactly right about um, the visual that really tell a story. Um, but um, you know, I think there there can be a place for a story. Um, a grant proposal doesn't have to be boring. It doesn't have to be like 100% formulaic. But you have to know, you know, different applications are very different. Some have character limits, some have very specific guidelines, they're online, you can't really tweak it too much, and then there's one that is, you know, 10 pages in the mail, and you might have room for something like that. And done well, it can work. Um, sometimes I might save it more for a report, like a, like a success story, um, but just don't overdo it. Don't be too anecdotal, you know, because you really you do want the numbers and that you know the hard facts to really do the talking. 
Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. Um, it looks like we're just about out of time for today. So on behalf of Nonprofit Pro and God One, I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Be sure to check out our webinar page to get more information on all our archived and upcoming webinars. And if you would like to take a minute to fill our brief feedback survey that will appear at your, on your screen next, we'll be very grateful. Your feedback will influence the webinars we bring to you in the future. I hope to see you guys in the next Nonprofit Pro. Great day.